life. It is comprised of many lessons. These lessons are to be learned. Average people learn from their mistakes, and the great ones from others. contractor and my other brother was a painter so basically they their goal was to get me out of the trades as fast as they could so they made me do all the um, the grunt work as far as like going to like doing roof jobs and things of that effect and their goal was to get me to go to college and obviously that's that was important to me um, as a result I went to college and they always taught me to take advantage of all the opportunities I had so I went down to uh, UMass Dartmouth and down there we basically um, I was doing marketing uh, and management as a major, double major. Mm. Um, while I was down there, basically I, I fell into an opportunity to kind of um, learn German. So they didn't really have many people taking German because no one takes German in America. Um, but as a result, they basically, if you take this class, we'll send so you over to... Germany has a bad issue for America. Uh, yeah, so it was one of those things I didn't really think anything of it. Like, yeah. just kind of... Like, I'll s we'll send you to Europe if you take this class for a semester. Mm -hmm. So a free trip was kind of really all the motivation I needed. Yeah. Um, so they sent me over there. I, I did an international business um, certificate in uh, University of Marburg and University of Mannheim. In Germany? Mm -hmm. So I was able to live over there for a couple months, kind of get to know the local culture. Uh, it was kind of interesting. You're over there. You think you're going to, like, learn German, like, be fluent. Mm -hmm. But the only thing all like the German girls want to do is they want to practice their English on you. Yeah. So as a result, you're kind of like you don't get as much out of it. But I mean, it was a super blast. Yeah. We ended up uh, doing like a Euro trip. We went through all Germany, through Italy, Amsterdam, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I definitely want to travel like that. It's definitely a blast, and highly suggest that someone else pays for it. It's even more fun. Yeah. Um, after doing that, I came back to the states, and then I um, went to school for a semester, and then I got I went back overseas and I was in um, Ireland at Galway at Hewlett Packard. So I was doing the same thing over there. They had a uh, apartment that was right next to the local dog track. So like every night you'd go gamble, you'd go have some fun. Dog races? Yeah. It was like totally foreign to me. Yeah. But it was like super man, interesting. Races. I don't think they have, I think they only, I don't think they have many around here anymore. For dog fighting. That's about it. Like it's the greyhounds, those big greyhound dogs that do yeah. like 70 miles an hour, that's what they were racing around. Oh, okay, yeah, no, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Like it was a good, cheap fun. Um, but it was cool to kind of see how the rest of the world views us. This was obviously uh, maybe 12 or so, 15 years ago. Yeah. So the, the world in general is kind of a little bit different. I, well, it's probably the same because I think the internationals weren't really a fan of George Bush, and now they're not really a fan of Trump. So, but everyone, you get this impression that the world like hates America, and everyone's like super friendly, and like it's just if you believe what like the TV says, like you'd never leave your house. Mm -hmm. But going over there was awesome. It was kind of eye opening, seeing how everyone else lives, what they're trying to get out of things, what their goals are, kind of hopes and whatnot. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, that's kind of my quick synopsis of my upbringing and college career. Yeah. Like, you, you're very, like, you're a very intelligent person. Like, I feel, I know you're intelligent. Like, how, what, what do you feel like was the thing that, like, motivated you to just be smart, truthfully? Because a lot of people have the ability, but not a lot of people have to take advantage of it. That's a good question because that goes back to the situation with my my father and parents doing the blue collar stuff. Yeah. So basically, everyone in my family was very smart, but I feel like a lot of them were like my father, for example. He was doing what he had to do to like support the family. So then my my brother, did, the oldest brother, did what he did because that's just what older brothers do. But then you can also see the bodies breaking down as they they do manual labor for so long. Um, so as that happened, I kind of anticipate that was going to be my my future of just kind of hobbling around in pain. Yeah. So the only way you can I could prevent that was basically if I can educate myself to kind of get to a point where people can't really dictate what I do. Yeah. Um, but because of that, the education allowed me to kind of I had my first job out of college within like ten days. What did you do? It was a, I was a project manager for Home Depot. It was nothing. Uh, glorious, but it was still like like crazy money for a 22-year-old. Um, so I was a regional project manager, so I went around all New England like checking out jobs. Um, but as a 22-year-old, basically the more jobs you did each month, the more money you made, so the more bonuses you got. So the more hustle equated to more money in your pocket, so as a result you were able to kind of live as well as you want to be for as much effort as you put into it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of a cool thing, and then after a while, working 12 hour days kind of gets old even if you are making a lot of money. Yeah. So then I switched gears and I uh, became a marketing manager at a uh, tow truck dealership. So <clears throat> over there, uh, it was a good friend, uh, Johnny LaMarche, he was the owner. And basically I went from being a project manager to a marketing manager and he gave me an opportunity to kind of have free reign of his money to do what I thought would ha ha help his business grow. Um, the cool thing that happened with him was basically like I tell my students like, you can screw up, just don't screw up twice, and that was pretty much his motto. Yeah. So it allowed me to kind of like try things, and as long as I didn't, I learned from my mistakes, then typically the next time around it made more money for him, it had a higher ROI, and kind of everything was happy. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I probably would have worked with John forever if he could have afforded me, but after a couple of years, it was just a um, like a 10-person shop. There's only so much to spread around, so I ended up making another decision uh, and this one kind of wasn't one of my smarter decisions, but I decided to like, at that particular point in life, I was more so like getting the safe job mm -hmm. and something that like, you know, it's going to be there forever. So I went into um, banking and as a result of going into banking, like it's, it's a reasonable income, but the issue with banking is you really can't have too, too much fun doing marketing. Like you can be a little bit creative, but everything has all this regulations and legal stuff. So there's not too much you can do with it. Um, the best thing that happened to me when I was at uh, at the credit union was that it actually allowed me to kind of figure out how important digital marketing was. So I used it like a little bit for uh, the dealership, but once I got to the credit union, um, they literally had no social media presence. And this was, uh, was it the, the mid to late 2000s? So you can imagine if you don't have a social media presence at that particular time, like you, there's lots of people that are trying to find you that can't find you. Mm -hmm. And then one of the most important things that we're using social media for at that particular time and still today is um, glorified digital word of mouth testimonials. Yeah. So we were able to turn that on and essentially at that particular time we used $10,000 in like social media spend to make a million dollars in loans. So it was a pretty like ridiculous ROI for something that the board of directors like really was against. That was back when like no one knew about social media though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was a, it was a, we're a little bit ahead of the curve, and it was, it was fun to kind of see what, what could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, credit union. Then we. Uh, I uh, I've been around in different industries, obviously. So the next thing was medical device. So working with like lasers and whatnot. So it was another interesting thing. But I went from uh, at the dealership. I was like one of ten. I was the marketing department. At the credit union, I was one of a hundred, but I was the marketing department. But then at the medical device company, I was like, I was one of like a marketing department of like a hundred. So I was just a cog. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really much freedom. Yeah. Kind of changes your whole dynamic of what you can do and can't do. What made you go there? It was a lot more money. Yeah. So that was a one of the biggest mistakes I made was chasing the money. Um, but fortunately, chasing that money allowed me to eventually end up in this situation. Uh, when I received my MBA from Assumption, I, I enjoyed the environment here. Um, but a big thing that I wanted, um, I, I'd always wanted to come back and kind of teach, but I didn't want to be a professor that didn't have any real world experience. So I always had in the back of my brain, like, after like being out in the real world for X amount of years, seven or eight years, I want to like go back and teach and be able to like share stories that will kind of work better than just like a glorified case study in a book. Um, and when I'm able to kind of work those into lessons I have, I think they work out really well. Um, I do feel like I need to kind of stay uh, in, uh, still doing like digital consulting on the side so I can still have fresh stories so that like they don't become stagnant and become a glorified book. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of uh, where I'm at currently. Do you, um, so you say like you still like to like market for people mm -hmm. on the side for like what companies? Because I'm, I'm like, I'm really, I want to like make a business, like an actual like company that does that, like I'm starting in the process of doing that. So all the businesses I have are all like friends of friend. Like so the traditional word of mouth is still like what's working best for me. Mm -hmm. So for example, I do um, digital marketing for Brew City on Shrewsbury Street and they, uh, um, I knew Jerry when he opened up in like 1997, I think I was like 12 years old. And then I had been going there on and off for I mean, when you say did digital marketing, so what do you mean? Uh, so we started off our relationship as I was doing his uh, his Facebook and Instagram social media presence, and then I like like you would like post like videos and pictures and stuff like that. Yeah, so creating his strategy for all his uh, his content, his text, his copywriting, his uh, promotion strategy, his hashtag game, his influencer strategy, kind of the whole soup to nuts as to why you should go there, how people are finding him, kind of hopefully making them differentiate from the pack. Mm -hmm. um, then we branched into actually launching a new website for them, kind of bring them into the, uh, the current decade. And now our latest uh, endeavor is we're focusing on trying to get him found on Google. On what? Trying to get him found on Google, so he's uh, um, his search on optimization. Yeah. So if you type in like restaurant in Worcester, we want to make sure he shows up for those type of things. Yeah. So it's kind of at the stage where we are right now. Um, and then I have uh, like six other customers that are kind of in the similar boat where I kind of know them from years in the past. They reached back out and made websites, do newsletter campaigns, Facebook campaigns, email campaigns. It all kind of varies on what they need. But nobody's like really, uh, I'm want, it's all small to medium sized businesses and I like I'm working with like Coca-Cola or anything, but it's still, it's fun and it's important I think in this role to be on abreast of what's changing out there. Yeah. It's, it's hard to do if you're not actually implementing it, I think. Yeah, definitely. So it's kind of an important state, I think. Speaking about that, like we were talking about um, last time, you talked about kind of what you wish you knew when you started. Mm. And like, could you just like kind of just go, go down a list about like the things that you would like tell students right now, like even though like the school might not say or professor might not say, learn it, you should definitely still start to learn it. Yeah, so I have a whole... Uh, Kind of a list of things to that effect um, that I kind of, as I think of in the middle of the night, I kind of put into a, a list and share with some people. Let me see where it is. So some of the important things that, um, a lot of the things that I've set myself up with because I came from a blue collar family is that I find it's important to kind of be financially smart and never be in a position where you're kind of like stuck under someone's thumb. Mm -hmm. So that being said, like as soon as you guys graduate, you have an opportunity for like a ton of free money. Like a lot of businesses will match your 401k. So if you were to um, put X, if you ma if they say they're going to match four and a half percent, basically you just got a four and a half percent raise. But most of the time, like t students don't do that. Um, the second thing that's really important, I think, is that you're going to get jobs that you don't really like, and as a result, you're you're going to be there and you're going to be miserable. It's going to affect your relationships. But the best way to present, prevent that from happening, in my opinion, is to always have a uh, 